Great. All right. Thank you for getting that started up there. Good morning, everybody. How are you all doing? Good. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. It's a great joy to be able to, to be with you here again today. Thank you for, for braving the, the fourth or the fifth or the sixth winter or whatever we're, we're up to at this point uh, for, for coming out here today. And also for everybody that will be joining us at some point later on, uh, catching up on, on YouTube. Appreciate that very much. Uh, what a joy it is to be able to, to continue being with you guys here today as we keep on going with our study of the martyrs. Uh, with today, we'll be a little past halfway through because we have uh, seven weeks. Uh, today, we're moving a little bit further. Uh, well, depending on last week, kind of the same period of history, really. Uh, last week, we looked at three martyrs from the set 200s, 300s. Uh, today, we're going to be looking at two martyrs this time from the same time period, uh, the mid-200s to the late uh, 200s and into the early 300s. Uh, last week, it was the same time period, but it was uh, some of the great women martyrs. So we looked at Perpetua, Agnes, and Agatha. Uh, this week, we're looking at some of the, the great and uh, some of my favorite male martyrs from that same time period, uh, starting off with St. Romanus, who is my personal favorite. And so we'll be spending a lot of time on him because there's just so much that we can learn from his story and his faithful witness uh, for us. And then also we'll be looking at St. Lawrence, who has some cool ties to this area uh, as well when we eventually get to him. Uh, why don't we start off with a word of prayer? Excuse me. <coughs> I've had the hiccups this morning, and so I, I'm hoping that they're, they're under control and not going to, to continue on during our, our Bible study today. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have given us this good land as our heritage. Grant that we may remember your generosity and constantly do your will. We ask that you bless our land with honest industry, truthful education, and an honorable way of life. Save us from violence, discord, and confusion, from pride and arrogance, and from every evil course of action. Grant that we, who came from many nations with many different languages, may become a united people. Support us in defending our liberties, and give those to whom we have entrusted the authority of government the spirit of wisdom, that there may be justice and peace in our land. When times are prosperous, may our hearts be thankful, and in troubled times, do not let our trust in you fail. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. So many good prayers here in the, in the Lutheran service book. There's just hundreds in there, and it's always uh, fun to, to look through those and pray through those uh, throughout our days. Uh, getting into it, uh, first of all, usually I like to start off with a, uh, with a quote uh, regarding our topic today. Uh, today's quote comes from Martin Luther himself of blessed memory, uh, but before that he is commentating on Psalm 116, and thought, so I thought that it would be nice to, to read through that. Specifically, the, the quote that I have here is from verse 15, uh, but Psalm 116 is not quite uh, terribly long. It's only 19 verses. Uh, so I thought I'd take just a couple minutes to, to read through that briefly so we have some of the context of what he's talking about. And I chose this verse, or this quote, uh, one, because Luther's commenting on the martyrs and he's got some wise and wonderful words to say to us, but also he mentions St. Lawrence in this quote, which is uh, the second martyr that we will be looking at today. And Luther is just a, a massive fan of the martyrs as, as he writes about them so often, uh, as he thinks that he will eventually be himself become a martyr uh, during that time of the Reformation, uh, and just how they inspired and strengthened his faith. And this is the same thing that they do for us today as well, as we gather and, uh, and learn about their lives. So Psalm 116, I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my pleas for mercy because he inclined his ear to me. Therefore, I will call on him as long as I live. The snares of death encompassed me. The pangs of Sheol laid hold on me. I suffered distress and anguish. Then I called on the name of the Lord. O Lord, I pray, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Our God is merciful. The Lord preserves the simple. When I was brought low, he saved me. Return, O my soul, to your rest, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. For you have delivered my soul from death, my, ear, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. 
I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I believed, even when I spoke, I am greatly afflicted. I said in my alarm, all mankind are liars. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. That's that verse that Luther's commentating on. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. O Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant, the son of your maidservant. You have loosed my bonds. I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. In the courts of the house of the Lord, in your midst, O Jerusalem, praise the Lord. And so here we come to our quote for today uh, on the screen for those who are uh, following along at home. Luther is commentating specifically about on the psalmist, and as he's dealing and wrestling uh, with all the context of suffering and affliction, uh, but then also calling upon the name uh, of the Lord in hope and comfort and that firm confidence uh, that we have. Luther says, Behold, how he, being the psalmist, consoles himself in his sufferings with spiritual words, that is, with words that speak of spiritual things. And he also has pity on the misery of his persecutors, on their error and lying. And from both, he rises up to the praise of God and becomes more and more courageous towards sufferings. And this is the true meaning of this psalm, which you could read in any martyr suffering agony with confidence, such as St. Lawrence, etc., so many others. The martyrs do these three things in their sufferings, as is clear. That is Martin Luther on Psalm 116, specifically verse 15. Uh, and then later on when we look at Lawrence, uh, I have some other longer quotes from Luther that just uh, speak to uh, the, the sass or the, the strength that the martyrs had even in the face of persecution and suffering. With that, let us continue on to, to learning briefly about uh, the summary of St. Lawrence, who he was, and also learning about his martyrdom. <clears throat> St. Romanus. The Christians in Antioch were being persecuted. Uh, so, so Romanus was martyred during uh, the 10th official persecution uh, of the church. That happened under Emperor Diocletian. Uh, and so, as we remember, during the, those early first three, four centuries of the church, uh, the, the church was going through waves of persecution. It, it, they were not always in, incredibly intense, uh, where uh, Christianity was being persecuted, they were being uh, sought out and dragged out and being martyred or imprisoned, uh, but they, it was also not at the same time, uh, everything was not always roses and daffodils, and so it really came in, in different waves. And so during the time that St. Romanus is taken, uh, arrested, and then martyred, it was under that 10th official. Uh, so this was a legal official persecution uh, that the Roman Empire was dealing out against the Christians. And this happened under Emperor Diocletian in the very early 300s, about maybe 303, 304, 305. The Christians in Antioch were being persecuted. Romanus, a deacon in Caesarea, so we'll learn more about deacons when we talk about Rome. Uh, Lawrence, Romanus, a deacon in Caesarea, traveled up to Antioch to strengthen his Christian brothers and sisters. The wolves are attacking the flock, but don't be afraid. Uh, these are words that he is calling out to his brothers and sisters as they are being arrested or dragged through the streets, and he's in the midst of the crowds and uh, all the, uh, the, uh, the accounts and the reports saying that he's just constantly preaching and calling out to them, strengthening them as they are being dragged off to go through persecution. The Lord used this preaching of Romanus to strengthen the faith of the Christians, and all of them, old men and women, fathers and mothers, young children, were ready to be martyred. None would renounce their faith and offer the sacrifice to Caesar. Uh, as soon we'll hear about the, the prefect who's coming to the city to deal with this problem, uh, now that they're in this another official persecution time of the church. Uh, and so the prefect uh, is coming because he's, re he's heard that these Christians are refusing to recant, they're refusing to deny Christ, uh, and so he's now coming uh, to try and also help deal with this. Uh, and soon he's going to hear about this person, Romanus, who has been encouraging them, strengthening them, preaching to them the Word of God, 
uh, and encouraging all of them. As he's seeing all these, uh, these elderly and these middle-aged people and even children coming before uh, the council and refusing to deny Christ, uh, he, he is quite perplexed and, and wondering who is the cause of all of this. And, and Romanus is going to have his fing- the finger pointed at him. None would renounce their faith and offer the sacrifice to Caesar. Instead, uh, the account said they willingly stuck out their necks for the sword, ready to die for their faith. Escalopades was captain in charge of the persecution. So he's now the, the prefect who has come to, to try and deal with this in even stronger show of force. And he asked who was the cause of this rebellion and learning of Romanus. He had Romanus bound and brought before him. Are you the cause of this sedition? Are you going to be the cause of so much death? You will suffer in the same way that you have caused others to suffer. But Romanus was not afraid. Quite the opposite. I joyfully accept your sentence, he answered the captain. I am ready to be sacrificed for my brethren. Of course, the captain was quite enraged at this, shouting, tie him up, tear him open, and pour out his bowels. So disembowel him. Uh, but as soon we'll, we'll, we'll learn that uh, the soldiers protested, it is not right to do so to a nobleman. Uh, so just like uh, Paul was, St. Paul, uh, Romanus is also a Roman citizen, and so he has some special privileges that are given to him. So Esculapades says, then scourge him with whips with the lead tips. So these are whips with uh, uh, little lead balls or shards put in them uh, to deal out in- increased damage and pain. And so he is whipped. Instead of tears and groans, Romanus sang psalms as he was whipped and told the soldiers not to favor him because of his nobility, saying, it's not my family, it's my Christian faith that makes me noble. And of course, this infuriated Esculapades even more, who ordered him to be lanced, uh, which is kind of have him strung up and then have knives run up and down his side so that his bones would show uh, white Kind of, it's very, Romanus, we're going to get into some really uh, disgusting stuff here soon as well. Very gruesome. Romanus preached through the torture, mocking the pagan gods, warning the captain that he would be judged by the creator of heaven and earth. Now here we, the captain had his sides lanced so that his ribs were exposed. And Romanus said, I'm sorry, not at my injuries, but that you believe lies. Romanus preached Christ. He urged the captain and all who could hear him to turn away from their idolatry and to trust in the blood of Jesus for eternal life. Esculapades commanded Romanus to be struck in the mouth to stop his preaching. Because Romanus, no matter what torture they're putting him through, he will not stop preaching Christ. And this is what, ended up, this is what caused him to be arrested in the first place. And so they knocked out his teeth. They tore his eyelids with their nails off. They cut open his cheeks with knives. They made slits in his cheeks, opened them up. They pulled out his beard with chunks of flesh. And to all of this, just listen to this. This is incredible, amazing stuff. Romanus said, I thank thee, O captain, that thou hast opened unto me many mouths, whereby I may preach my Lord and Savior Christ. Look how many wounds I have. So many mouths I have, lauding and praising God. And then uh, a section of Romanus' story that I did not include, uh, that, I, I, that I'll skip. Uh, a boy is called forth from the crowd, uh, as this is all going down, as he's being tortured uh, before, the, uh, before all the people that have gathered there. Uh, it's a seven-year-old boy who refuses to deny, deny Christ, uh, and that boy is killed. And so if you want to, to read the story, uh, I can share that with you, uh, but I, I do not want to. So a great fire is built. Uh, so they, uh, Esclopades decides that en- enough torture has happened, so they're going to build this massive fire for Romanus to be burned alive. And so they toss Romanus on the fire, but the storm has now happened. Uh, and so the storm puts out the fire uh, which causes a great deal of anger. Again, for Esculapades, you're just getting angrier and angrier and angrier. And eventually, he just has Romanus tossed into prison, uh, where he eventually has Romanus strangled to death uh, a couple weeks later after uh, continuing to 
experienced the pain of everything that he had gone through. And so in a, in a very brief summary, that is Romanus, who is a martyr and also one of our Christian heroes. And we will meet Romanus in the resurrection uh, and what stories he will have to share with us. And they will all be joyful. Uh, I'm sure that we, will, we might weep. <laughs> well, all of our tears will be gone. Uh, we will praise God for giving him the strength uh, to endure all that he went through. And that was quite a bit. Now, thinking about Romanus, uh, Romanus' background uh, is the setting is in Palestine. Uh, Romanus came from, was born in the city of Caesarea. Uh, we do not have the date of his birth, like so many of the other martyrs, uh, which is kind of incredible given how early they lived. Uh, but we do not have the dates of his, uh, of his birth. Uh, and in Caesarea, that's the, the same place that Paul was once imprisoned for a few days uh, as he was uh, arrested in Jerusalem and brought to uh, Caesarea. Uh, and then in prison there, at maybe five or six days. I can't remember off the top of my head. Uh, but Romanus is from Caesarea, but he travels up to the city of Antioch, which Paul gets a, a start in the missionary uh, work there. So he goes to Antioch during the beginning of that 10th official persecution, which happened under Diocletian. Uh, and, and as uh, historians are rap- wrestling with those dates, it's some, somewhere around 303, 304, 305 uh, that this is occurring uh, most likely 303 would be the, the ideal date, uh, but we don't have uh, 100% certainty on that. And so that's a little bit about our, our brother in the faith, Romanus. Uh, and to remember that he's also a Christian noble. He is a Roman citizen, and so he does get some of those special privileges uh, that will, well, he had those special privileges up to a point. Uh, they didn't want to, he wasn't allowed to be disemboweled, but he sure went through just about anything and everything else that uh, one being tortured could go through. Now, if you have your Bibles with you, I want you to open up to Romans chapter 5. Uh, no association with Romanus. Uh, Romanus, Romans. Uh, I thought that was interesting. <laughs> uh, but if you want to open up to Romans chapter 5, verses 3 to 5, uh, I want to, to read that and look at that because Romanus is truly just quite the living embodiment of Romans chapter 5. And if you don't have your Bibles, I, I, yes, I do have that up on the screen as well. I'm going to read on the screen is verses 1 to 5, and I'm going to read uh, 1 to 5 as well. Romans chapter 5, verses 1 to 5. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. And so the Lord intends with our suffering to walk us down that path of patience, character, and hope. And as we think about that, being called to rejoice in our suffering, uh, that seems like madness to us and especially to the world. Uh, The world wants to run away from suffering, wants to eliminate it. Uh, It wants to avoid suffering at all costs, saying this is a terrible, bad thing that we must avoid and eliminate as much as we possibly can in our own lives. And so that might cause us to to build up safety even as an idol. Now, now safety is a very good thing. It is good, and we rejoice uh, if we have been provided that safety uh, through God. Uh, But safety easily can even become an idol for us to avoid suffering at any cost. And so as we look and as we read and as we study the lives of the martyrs uh, to see how they uh, they took on this suffering, uh, they did not run away from it, uh, but they persevered through it by the strength uh, of clinging to Christ our Lord. And, and so the devil is using suffering. The, the devil has so many ways that he's going to attack Christians. Uh, as we have been baptized and as we've been claimed by Christ and, and as we confess our faith in him, uh, a huge target has been placed upon us. Massive bullseye uh, with our name on it. Uh, we have been named, one, as a child of God, and we rejoice greatly for that. 
But also we are the enemy of Satan, and he is going to, uh, uh, to attack us and suffer uh, through suffering to attack that hope that we have been given. And so as we think about that, doubt, that is one of the big things that Satan is going to attack us with. That is one of the great goals that Satan has for us. And now as we think about it, the goal that God has for us is for us to die in faith in Christ, to die with that faith. And if that's the goal for, for that God has for us, well, that means that Satan, as our enemy, the goal that Satan has for us is to put that faith to death, for us to die without having that faith, that hope, that, for, that firm assurance in Christ. And so that goal of doubt is that goal of Satan. And he wants to attack us uh, through so many ways uh, in order to get us to, to put that faith to death uh, that we have been claimed by Christ. And, and now that Christ has suffered for us uh, in one of the most incredible ways, we actually receive suffering as a gift. Uh, we see that here in Romans chapter 5 as we are being called to rejoice in suffering. Uh, but I think the most clear passage is in uh, where is that? Philippians, the end of Philippians chapter 1. Uh, we'll be looking at that maybe next week as well, receiving uh, suffering as a gift. And even though it seems shameful to us, it might seem shameful to the world uh, to see suffering as a gift, uh, just suffering in general might seem shameful. We also remember that Jesus was mocked and ridiculed, and, and it, through Him, that suffering has been sanctified and becomes a treasure, a gift that God gives to us. Uh, that's what the end of Philippians 1 talks about. We receive these two gifts from God. One, we receive faith, uh, and we'll say, yeah, I'll take that one. Uh, but then we also receive suffering as a gift. Christ enter, as, as we think about that, uh, Christ entered into our suffering. And so when we come to the, the question uh, of why are we going through this suffering, or why is there so much suffering in the world? Or why is someone experiencing going through all of these trials and these sufferings? Oh, one, we can look to the cause and say sin, that we live in a fallen and sinful world, and how we rejoice that Christ has overcome all of those things. And we look forward to the full uh, revealment of that as Christ returns. But also, we, we don't really can't answer that question. Why, why this suffering? Why is this person going through this? Why, why is this suffering coming to me? We can look at the cause of sin, but also we, we don't exactly have, we can't concretely point to the answer. That is in the hiddenness of God that we cannot answer, but we can kind of wander close to an answer. And, and that's kind of where we should be going instead of saying definitively, this is why we are going through this suffering. But we can wander through uh, what God is doing in the midst of our suffering. So we, can, we might want to wonder, well, God is all-powerful and all-good, and so He could eliminate suffering at any moment in time. He could, just, he could take it away. But God, in His wisdom and in His mercy, uh, realizing, one, that God is God and that we are not, that God is the creator of all things, that we are creatures, God is at work through all things for good, and as God sees this suffering and uh, sin and death and all of these things that have occurred, uh, His answer is not to just eliminate it right away, but for some reason, whatever that might be, in the wisdom of God, He chooses to enter into that suffering. He says, this is the way that I am going to deal with this problem of suffering. I will enter into your suffering and I will deal with it. I will take all of it. Uh, Hebrews, two times the writer of Hebrews tells us that Jesus Christ, our great high priest, has suffered and gone through every uh, temptation that we could possibly go through. Every suffering, Christ has endured that. So Christ says, I see your sin, and I'm going to enter into that. And I'm going to take all of it upon myself. He says, I see your death, and I am going to enter into that and take it for you so that through me you might have life. So as we deal with that problem of suffering, uh, one, we, we don't have the answer in our fallen and sinful state, in our limited capacity of our mind. That answer uh, resides in the hiddenness of God of why, uh, why bad things happen to good people. And of course we could say, well, there are no good people. 
There are none. But at the same time, there was one good person. There was one. And he entered into our suffering, into that sin, into that death as the answer to deal with all of it. And so we rejoice for that. I put down on there a message from the prophets as a bullet point. One of the great messages as we, as we read through the Old Testament, uh, through the great prophets and the minor prophets, uh, one of the, the resounding themes in there is that you become, you become like what you worship. Uh, we see that all the time with Israel as they continue to fall into sin. They continue to bow down to whatever idols are, are in their midst at that point in time. And as they do that, they become more and more like what they worship. Or the surrounding nations uh, with their fa- false idols or child sacrificing or all kinds of things that are going on. You become like what you worship. And so with that, that theme in our minds, as we read through the, the accounts of the martyrs and the sufferings that they went through, well, we also become like what we worship. And we worship Christ. Christ crucified, risen from the dead, yes, but we worship Christ crucified, the one who suffered for us. And as we continue to, to live in that reality of being claimed by God, being brought into His kingdom, uh, we continue to be, uh, to be shaped and molded into His image. And so we shouldn't be surprised when suffering comes because suffering came for Christ Himself. And He entered into that uh, willingly for us to deal with it all. Because we worship the God who suffered. That's that last bullet point. We worship the God who suffered. Uh, And so we we also should not be surprised uh, when suffering comes our way. Which is very much against one of those those main themes of American Christianity. Uh, Thankfully not in the Lutheran church, uh, but so much in American Christianity in our minds. It's once I become a Christian, I have this faith, things are going to be okay for me. Uh, Things are going to go better. But that is such a, a dangerous and false thought uh, that the world and the devil and our sinful flesh will always be looking to attack us with if that is our expectation uh, for what it means to live as a child of God this side of the resurrection. For Scripture everywhere, everywhere, all the over the place is warning us that in this Christian life will be one of suffering. That there will be trials, there will be temptations, and there will be things that we must wrestle with. And Christ himself, the the Bible, Christ, Paul, all of these these sources are telling us, don't be surprised when suffering comes your way. As Christ says, the world hated me first. And so first, as we think of hatred, it goes to Christ. But then also, then it comes for those who have been claimed by Christ, for those who are in Christ. And that includes us as well. And so as we're dealing with that problem of suffering uh, and that, that problem of pain, and as we're looking at that, is very helpful, helpful for us, one, for this Bible study in particular, to remember our brothers and the sisters in the faith who went through that and who endured it by clinging on to Christ. But also to realize that it, it, it's not surprising that suffering has come my way, that I'm going through whatever this might be, uh, that we have had lots of warnings from Christ that these things are coming. Moving on, the devil attacks the Word of God but is overcome by that word. And, and as I think about that, uh, something that I, I wasn't able to, to fit into the summary of Romanus, at some point throughout all the tortures and the, the persecution that Romanus is going through, uh, I wrote this down, Esculapides says to Romanus, so this is, a, this is something that he cries out to him as he's having his beard torn out and uh, all kinds of uh, cuts and his eyelids torn. He tells Romanus, your crucified Christ is but yesterday's God. The gods of the Gentiles, the gods of the Romans, are from of old and from antiquity. Now, do you have any idea what Romanists might have done after that? Because it's, it's, it's just great. So Romanus is sitting there or standing or whatever, wherever he's strung up at this point, being tortured and he's bleeding and you can imagine his teeth are missing, his eyelids have been torn off, his beard is maybe half on at this point. And Asclepiades is saying, your crucified Christ, he's yesterday's news. He's gone. He's dead. He's out of here. But look at all these Roman gods that we have. These are from of old and have lasted. 
and Romanus, the, the, the accounts say that Romanus took this occasion to preach the eternality of Christ. So as he's going through this, he, uh, Romanus takes this opportunity to preach that Christ has always existed. He preaches the eternality of Christ. He preaches his human nature. He preaches about Christ's death, his resurrection, and the satisfaction that Jesus won for us on the cross. So even in the midst of going through all of this, Christ, Romanus is still proclaiming the truth of God's Word, uh, calling upon them uh, to believe. And it's just uh, incredible uh, that the devil attacks our hope with this suffering. But by Christ, through Christ, by His power, as we go through this suffering, we too become ones who overcome the devil, overcome this suffering uh, as, as the Lord strengthens our hope and our faith in Him. And so even though the devil might be attacking us with all of these, from all these directions and all of these ways, with all of these sufferings, Christ says to us, eh, I have overcome those things. And so too will you overcome through me. It's a beautiful lesson that Romanists and so many of the martyrs teach us. And the, that, that's one of the, the great uh, lessons that the martyrs teach us as well, is that to remind us that we are not alone in our struggles. Uh, we are not the first to walk down this path of suffering uh, or whatever it may be, persecution, if that does come for us, or martyrdom, God forbid, if that does come for us, uh, we are not the first to walk down this path. Uh, and just as St. Romanus did for those Christians, as he's in Caesarea and he's hearing about this, this another official persecution that the church is going through, he travels to Antioch to encourage his brothers and sisters to stand with them firm in the faith, to preach to them the word of God, and to be with them. And just as he did for our brothers and sisters in Antioch who were facing martyrdom there, well, so too Romanus still does for us today through his faithful witness as we read about that and learn from it. And, and his witness becomes quite the model uh, for us as we live with one another, as we go through this life of the body of Christ. Now, I, I pray that none of us will, would go through martyrdom, uh, but whatever suffering we would be going through, well, Romanus really gives us that great image of the body of Christ coming together to help shoulder each other's burdens to bear those with one another. Uh, so many of, uh, of the prayers of the church begin with, we rejoice with those who rejoice and we mourn with those who mourn. This is the, the, the life of the Christian who has been claimed by God, brought into his kingdom, and now we live in community with the other members of that body of Christ. And we care for them and we love them and we support them uh, just as Romanus uh, did for his brothers and sisters in Antioch. And he truly becomes that great model and imitator of Christ. Uh, as, as Christ himself has suffered, so too as, is Romanus shaped and formed by the word of God and continue to do so even in the midst of his suffering until he received the crown of life. I'd like to also flip to Romans chapter 12, uh, verses 1 to 2, if you'd like to, to go there. Romans 11, and, and, or excuse me, Hebrews chapter 11 and 12 uh, are just some of the, the greatest in the, well, the whole, the whole writing of Hebrews is fantastic. Uh, but 11, 12, that, that great hall of faith and then moving into the great cloud of witnesses, uh, especially for a study looking at the martyrs, it's very applicable and, and, and great to look at. So I'm looking at ver Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 to 2, where the writer of the Hebrews writes, Therefore... Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings to us so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Now there are so many uh, so many witnesses included in that great cloud of witnesses. Uh, we typically read this uh, during All Saints Day. Uh, that, that is a, a, a time in the church here where we are remembering that great crowd, cloud of witnesses. Uh, but I've written in here, remember St. Romanus. Uh, I mean, there's so many. Uh, we could say that for, for every, <laughs> we could put every martyr's name that we learn about in this great cloud of witnesses. 
uh, but I do have in there, remember St. Romanus. Earlier, uh, I have passages that say, remember St. Polycarp, or remember St. Perpetua, or whatever, uh, to recall our brothers and sisters who have gone before us uh, and who have paid uh, the price for their faith with that ultimate, that ultimate price. And so as we talk about the martyrs and as we look through their stories, uh, in this study we're talking about the martyrs, uh, but we always want to remember that those martyrs are just other racers uh, in that race. Uh, they are the ones who have finished the race, uh, who have kept the faith, uh, and they are, the one, they are the ones who have the same finish line as we do. Talking about Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 to 2, running that race, uh, who are the, the martyrs but those are fellow racers. Uh, and they have the same finish line as we do, which is Christ himself, uh, the finish line of the right hand of the Father uh, and rejoicing uh, with him for all eternity. Are there any questions about Romanus before we move on to, to Lawrence, who has uh, much less information, and so it won't take uh, as much time as, as Romanus did? Yeah. Absolutely. So, I mean, that's the comfort I could get, and I get that he's there to support, to help, to guide, mm-hmm. all that there, you know, that, that I'm not alone in going through these things. Yes, absolutely. So, so for those uh, who, who, who couldn't hear here or online, uh, the, the comment, w- which was beautiful, is that even as we go through our suffering, our persecutions, our trials, our temptations, to remember that Christ also walks with us. That as we've been claimed by Christ and claimed by God and brought into his kingdom, Christ dwells in us. And that we are continuing as we gather here in the church or as we read our Bibles or uh, whatever that might be, uh, we are continuing to be fed and given that faith. Uh, God is continuing to give faith as a gift to us every time that word is read or spoken or preached or as we remember our baptism every day and live in that baptismal life. Every time as we come to the altar to receive there his true body and blood as he strengthens us in that faith. And to remember that he says, yes, I have ascended, I have, but here I am exactly where I have promised to be with you. I have promised to be in the waters of baptism, I have promised to be in the Lord's Supper, I have promised to be where two or three dwell in, and I dwell in their midst. And I promise that I am in you as I have claimed you. And to realize that just as Christ has suffered, so we too suffer. And as we are formed into his image, uh, he does continue to be with us, even in the midst of that. Yes. All right. There's our image, uh, a painting of, of dear brother Romanus, who we will meet in the resurrection. All right. St. Lawrence or Lawrence, depending on our pronunciation, if we're looking at uh, our English or if we're looking at German spelling, uh, and you'll probably recognize that spelling of Lawrence uh, quite well being from, from this area. If not, we'll, we'll talk about that soon. I'll read the, uh, the summary of St. Lawrence. The apostles established the office of deacon. Deacons help their bishops and pastors by tending to the collection, management, and distribution of alms, which are gifts for the poor, those in crisis, and for the clergy. Since the bread and wine that were used for the Lord's Supper were gifts of the people, the deacons also had the responsibility to prepare them, set the table, and even help distribute them. Many large congregations copied the example of the apostles in Acts chapter 6 and appointed seven deacons, the head of which organized their work and connected them to the bishop. Lawrence was such a deacon. He was most likely born in Spain toward the early part of the third century, and he met and became fast friends with a man who would end up being Pope Sixtus II, Bishop of Rome. Together, they journeyed to Rome. When Sixtus was elected the bishop of the city, he appointed his friend Lawrence to be his chief deacon. In those days, the Roman Empire, the Roman, I should say the Roman Emperor, Valerian, made it policy that whoever was denounced as a Christian was to be summarily executed. So Lawrence lives in a time of very high, intense persecution. All his possessions would be given over to the empire's treasury. It was further ordered that all the Christian clergy should be killed. Sixtus had not been bishop even for a full year. He and many of his clergy with him were denounced and taken custody 
while celebrating a liturgy in a cemetery. That occurred on August 6, 256. Right after the death of his friend and his spiritual father, Lawrence was brought before the prefect of Rome. He was ordered to turn over to the Roman treasury all the treasures of the church. And why? Because the prefect understood that deacons handled the church's wealth. So as we think about those deacons, they are being tasked with caring for some of the material possessions that the church has, distributing the alms to the poor, those in a crisis, uh, bringing together the elements for the Lord's Supper. Uh, and so the, the, the Roman government knows that if someone is a deacon, that means that they have uh, access to so much of the church's wealth. So the prefect understood that the deacons handled the church's wealth and he's requiring Lawrence to turn over everything to the Roman governor, government. So Lawrence asked for three days to assemble the treasure. He spent those days giving away to the poor as much of the church's material wealth as he possibly could. And on the third day, he appeared before the prefect, who again demanded the church's treasure. The gutsy deacon then called forth an assembly of the poor folk whose lives the church's charity had touched. He brought in the disabled and the sick. And that's where he said to the prefect, these, these are the treasures of the church. Which, of course, uh, I'm, I'm sure we can imagine did not sit well uh, with the prefect and the Roman government. The enraged prefect ordered a gridiron prepared and well heated. So I, uh, later on we'll have a picture of what a gridiron might look like. Uh, but it was, it's a grid uh, with, made of iron. Uh, obviously, uh, but it has holes in it, uh, so it's not, a, it's not a solid sheet. It is a grid with uh, squares punctured out holes in it so it could get really hot uh, and somebody would be laid on that. Lawrence was placed over the fire. After he endured the agony for a time without uttering a word or a cry, this is, uh, I, I said Romanus is my favorite uh, uh, my favorite male martyr because of, uh, as he talks about it, when his cheeks are cut open, he's saying, look how many mouths I have praising God. Thank you for this. Uh, here comes some more sass uh, and spunk of the martyrs. So he's, he's been sitting on the gridiron for a couple minutes, heating up, and he cries out quite cheerfully, the, the eyewitnesses say, you can turn me over now. I'm done on this side. Uh, and I didn't include it, uh, but also he says, you can turn me over now. I'm done on this side. Uh, you, I'm ready to be eaten. Obviously, he knows he's not going to be eaten. Uh, the Romans are cannibals, uh, but that's just the, the, the humor, even at this point in time that, that Lawrence has. Romanus was a mighty witness to Nehemiah's words, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Kind of talking about that point of Christ being with us even in the midst of our sufferings. The joy of the Lord is your strength. And oh my, how the martyrs had to, to depend on the joy of the Lord uh, to get through that. The story of Lawrence's martyrdom was seared into the memory of the young and growing church. The commemoration of his death is observed on August 10th, which is the date that he died. And in Frankenmuth, Michigan, stands a large and lovely Lutheran church named in honor of this cheerful deacon, devoted to mercy and the true treasures of the church, being St. Lawrence. Lawrence, that is our brother in the faith. He is a martyr and also one of our dear Christian heroes, and we will also meet him in the resurrection. How many people have been to Frankenmuth? <laughs> I see Pastor in the, in the lobby raising his hand too. I've been, I've been there, I've been blessed to be there twice now, uh, both times that my family came up to visit, uh, Sarah and I, and then Sarah's family, when they came up to visit Sarah and I, uh, they both wanted to, to go to Frankenmuth and, and see St. Lawrence, and so it, what a joy that was. Uh, just an incredible, incredible church to, to witness there. Hey, and so, uh, as many of you might have already known, uh, but that name was, the name of that church was named after this deacon of the church who lived very early on in the 200s the deacon St. Lawrence. Uh, Lawrence was born, uh, here's one of the martyrs that we have, his, his birth date. He was born December 31st, 225, uh, and, and most accounts say that he was born in Hispania, which was the Roman name for the Iberian Peninsula. Uh, so we don't know exactly uh, the city or the region in particular that he was born, but he was born somewhere in that Iberian Peninsula. Born December 31st, 225, and martyred August 10th, 258, 
aged 33, and he died in Rome again. And then uh, this church that we see here on the screen, uh, that is Saint, or San Lorenzo Church. Uh, and according to tradition, that church is built on the exact site uh, that Lawrence was martyred on, uh, where he was uh, gridironed alive, uh, flayed, gridironed, burned, uh, whatever that technical term might be. But which is cool. Uh, has anybody been to Rome? I've never been. I would love to go to Rome. Uh, did you guys see this church? It's not, a, it's not a massive uh, tourist attraction, but there it sits, uh, and it would be cool to, to visit at some point and to realize that on this very, that very site, our brother in the faith uh, persevered through it by the strength of Christ. And so, real briefly, I know we're, uh, we went late last time, and so I don't want to do that again to you guys. Uh, a few important things that we can learn about St. Lawrence, our brother. First is that I think we really can learn comedy. Uh, we can learn humor. Uh, now, it's not funny what, what Lawrence went through as he was tortured and as he was laying on that gridiron, but as he called out, <laughs> as he called out to those who were doing this to him that, hey, you can turn me over because I'm done on this side. I'm roasting. I'm ready to be flipped over before you eat me. It, it, it is quite humorous in, in a, a gruesome and morbid sort of way, uh, and that in a world that is so deadly serious about everything, that is deadly uh, serious about sins and greed and cruelty, uh, everything, that even in the midst we can have joy and humor, uh, even in the midst of going through that. As, as Lawrence lives out those, those words of Nehemiah, the joy of the Lord is your strength. And so much, so many of the martyrs go through their, go either go into their suffering or through their suffering with joy and celebration, realizing that through that, whatever they go through, they will be overcoming uh, sin, death, and the devil and rejoicing. And we can learn from Lawrence just to laugh, to see how ridiculous the world might be at times uh, and to realize that through, through that suffering, uh, Lawrence knew what was coming for him and he rejoiced greatly in it. Uh, I have some, some quotes from Luther that, uh, that talk about that joy or that spunk or that sass of the martyrs uh, that I'd like to share with you. Luther writes, Satan is an angry adversary. He does not worry much about thoughts. Something must be found in you which will prove too strong for Satan. And this was apparent in the martyrs. How bold they were. What spirit and courage they displayed when they confronted the judges, fully aware that life and limb, honor and goods were at stake. Such conduct calls for consolation not for a mere thought. It must be a matter of the heart that a person can face death in every trial cheerfully and say, honor, goods, life, and limb, all that is earthly, and be gone. I am determined to remain here, right here in my suffering. Then it will become manifest whether or not a person is a Christian and remains constant by means of his thoughts. That's in Luther's works, verse 20, er, uh, edition 23. So as we think about that, as we think about uh, what Luther says to us, and also as we think about the, the, the accounts of the martyrs, uh, we learn that in one sense, faith is mocking the devil. Uh, and those are not two different acts, but two sides of the same coin, receiving that faith and being able to mock the devil, realizing that there is nothing that he could possibly do to us that has not been defeated and overcome by Christ. Believing, that, uh, believing the Lord is disbelieving that great liar uh, and trusting in God is despising Satan. Luther continues, We will turn the tables on him and learn to mock both the devil and the world. Then we will laugh gleefully at them. They will not laugh at us. The skill with which they want to make us sad, angry, and impatient will fail them, and, th and they will consume themselves together with their hatred and wrath. And when they see us, they will suffer great agony. They will see that we remain cheerful through it all and scorn them, then scorn them when they attempt to vent their anger on us so vehemently. Uh, this confident faith, this is the faith of the martyrs and the faith that we have received as well. And it's joyful and bold suffering, uh, that, which is a fruit of the Spirit. Uh, and there's so many more, but I, I won't uh, read all of them for us. But the second thing that we can learn uh, from Lawrence, 
The second thing that we can learn from him uh, is exactly what he preached and he proclaimed uh, to the prefect there, that these are the treasures of the church. And as we think about that, we have received so many gifts and treasures from God. Uh, we receive his, his word, which is the gift of all gifts, the life-creating, faith-giving gift. We receive baptism and Lord's Supper and absolution and the gathering of all the church. All of these things are uh, part of the gifts that God has given to us. But what is the gift of God? Or what, what is the treasure of God? The treasure of God is his saints. As we think about Psalm 115, which we, or Psalm 116, which we read uh, to begin this, that the, the death of the saints is precious in his eyes. But also I have on there Matthew 13, 44, which I think was the, the first sermon that I preached here uh, when I started Vicarage. Uh, but it is uh, the parable of the great treasure and how God looks at us as his great treasure, which he goes out and he sells everything for in order to possess, in order to buy that we are that great treasure uh, to God. Yes. With that, uh, I've also finished off here. Uh, does anybody have the Treasury of Daily Prayer? That's a great CPH resource that they put out. Uh, it, it goes through every single day of the church year. Uh, it has uh, the lectionary readings. It has a reading from the church fathers or from Luther or from somebody. It has uh, prayers. It has colics. It has all kinds of interesting things in there. And on August 10th, on the commemoration day of St. Lawrence's martyrdom, uh, this is the prayer, and this is the prayer that we'll, we'll finish class with today, our study. Go through bars and fences to those who are imprisoned for the sake of your name. Strengthen them for a good witness, and let them not waver in the confession of your name. Teach us through their example and the example of so many holy martyrs to be ever watchful for the confession of your Son's name. Let us not be put to shame when the evil foe lays his hand on us. But if it is your will that we be persecuted for confessing as our Lord and only Savior, then we ask that you support us by your grace, that we, that we may withstand all trials and grant us peaceful rest. In the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Great. Thank you again for coming. Thanks for tuning in online and looking forward to, to next week. Oh, there is our picture of, of Lawrence. <laughs>